I'm going to welcome you again uh, to SFOX's latest webinar in its Assets and Alloca uh, Asset Allocators in Crypto series, uh, a series of webinars and related content we've been putting out for the past little while uh, with the thesis that, if you can believe it, um, the Bitcoin white paper is already 15 years old. Before you know it, uh, forget about pizza. It'll be old enough to buy itself a beer. Uh, and so as much as it might seem like an emerging asset class, uh, the sector and the way in which people are approaching it and institutions are approaching it uh, has become rapidly more and more sophisticated over the last few years. And so for those who are taking that really seriously, uh, whether you're already on the front lines or you want to better understand how to get to the front lines of getting exposure to crypto as an asset class, uh, we want to give you access to the community and the tools that are going to help you succeed in doing that. So that's what this series is all about. Uh, this particular webinar in which you find yourself today is all about the pit crew of crypto fund management. So we've had a couple of webinars so far. I'm um, speaking with some fund managers uh, and people guiding strategies when it comes to um, operating various uh, crypto enterprises um, and funds and the like. But now we're going to turn our attention to some of the providers behind the scenes uh, who are instrumental in making that all possible. Uh, and if you're thinking about either setting up a fund, scaling your operations, figuring out how to take the next step in professionalizing, uh, I imagine uh, either you have already discovered or you will soon discover how much more there is to it than simply deciding which assets to trade uh, and what strategies to use. Uh, the, the lion's share of the work, uh, as is oftentimes the case, is what you see below the surface of the iceberg uh, and all the different strategies and support that is crucial to making that happen. So if that feels either overwhelming or like a black box to you, don't worry, uh, we're going to demystify it over the next hour and hopefully leave you with some actionable guidance and a whole new understanding of the state of play. Uh, to that end, uh, I'm Aaron Saduco, the head of content at SFOX. I'll be acting as moderator, and I'm delighted to be joined by Kumar Ujwal, the, co the founder and CEO of Dwellfi, and Jack Finio, the head of product at SFOX. Gentlemen, welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, I know we're going to cover a lot of really interesting ground over the next hour, and I'd love if we could just start off uh, with each of you giving uh, just a little snapshot of the back of your baseball card in terms of where you've been, how you got into crypto, uh, how you found yourself here today. Uh, Kamar, maybe we can kick things off with you and then go over to Jack afterwards. Yeah, thank you. Aaron. Thank you for having me. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so my name is Kumar, founder and CEO for Dwellfi. Uh, how I got into crypto, stumbled in crypto 11 years back uh, uh, since I think 2011 actually, and uh, when Bitcoin was just a new asset class launched, and one of my buddy from college, he was uh, happened to be a Bitcoin core developer contributor in that, and he just gave me an exposure to that. That's how I got uh, that Bitcoin <laughs> uh, bug, and then through since then I've been always uh, in this space. I've seen ups and downs in the uh, the cryptos. Uh, a new, always new L1 blockchain, L2 blockchains, a lot has happened so far. But now the more, <laughs> the important thing is now it's become a real asset class and institutional adoption. That's the big thing uh, that everyone is excited about. So yeah, uh, and my personal background is uh, I'm a, trained by a software engineer uh, and have a several companies so far, three, three startup and most recently working on Dwellfi, solving uh, one of the large problem in the asset management, uh, which is fund administration and asset management and how you uh, basically deploy these strategies. And at the same time, you have a clear picture about your funds. So that's what we're doing. Thank you. I know we'll be getting much more into all of the nitty gritty of Dwellfi over the next hour. Um, I love that though, talking about getting the crypto bug. I feel like so many people go with the <laughs> metaphor of going down the rabbit hole, but uh, sometimes it does feel more like getting a bug. So that, mm -hmm. that, uh, that resonates with me. Mm -hmm. Jack, how about you, my friend? Thank you, Aaron. Uh, yeah, thanks for for having me. Obviously, uh, head of product at Xbox, been with the firm for a, over a few years now. Uh, been in crypto since 2015. Uh, started a company that was kind of I don't know, involved in NFTs before NFTs really became a thing and then went on to uh, found a quantitative systematic crypto hedge fund. Um, ended up building a lot of, you know, trade, order, and execution management systems and software, which ultimately led me to uh, joining SFOX. So yeah, very excited to uh, jump in with everyone here. 
Likewise, um, before we jump into the conversation, uh, friends in the audience, I'll let you know, and if you've been to our previous webinars, you'll be old hat at this, but uh, we do hope to make these as interactive as possible. We want them to really be as useful to everyone as possible, especially those who take the time to be here live. So there is a Q&A box. Feel free to contribute to it at your leisure as questions arise, especially if those questions can be directly useful to you in your own crypto adventures. Uh, and we will aim to address as many of those as possible by the end of the webinar. Uh, but don't worry if you are shy, I will interject more than once to bully you into asking things by the end of this. Uh, for the time being, let's start by dwell, uh, by dwelling on a few more of Dwellfy's services. <laughs> uh, Kumar, you told me a little bit about your background. Love to get into a bit more depth about what it is that you're building and offering at Dwellfy, why you feel that's an important step forward um, for people who are getting exposure to an investment in the crypto space, whether they're individual or institutions. Yeah, I'd love to. So at the core ethos about the Dwellfy is we focus on how to bring real world asset uh, in the crypto space. And our day from day one, would be when we started building it, we wanted to bridge this gap between a digital asset and the physical asset. So if you look at if you zoom out, you see that okay, there is a lot of uh, real world assets sitting in this. Uh, in the world and it's locked in when i say locked means liquidity locked and can't be exposed uh, into the digital room because of the regulations and there's a bunch of other stuff which we can always take a lot of time to discuss but the short answer is how to bridge those gap between these two worlds. so that's where we come in so that's how we started the company our core focus was building this asset and bringing in the the digital world when we started building it, we realized there is a not, this is not the easy way to do it. There's a bunch of other problems to handle it. So how we look at the assets in the world is two ways. Uh, the, the asset has always uh, two things. One, any asset has an intrinsic value attached to that. And that intrinsic value is basically your, is, is caused by your data. So take an example of a physical world, uh, like a building. Uh, that building will have like three types of intrinsic value. One is your principal, then your appreciation, depreciation, and then some yield. So similarly, you can take any asset and it will always have an intrinsic value, but that intrinsic value of a data. So what we do at the core of the company is we bring all the data related to any asset. Does it matter crypto or non-crypto? But bring it to the here and then use our blockchain as a source of truth and transparency and auditability. So put it on that one and then make it enable to people who need that to access that information. And then you can do reporting, valuation, bunch of other things, whatever is required in the funding eventually. That's 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 what we do. So we can work with a non-crypto asset or a crypto asset and bring it in a in a more like a digital format. That's really interesting, Kumar. So it sounds like, although Dwellfy is, is certainly well suited for the management of crypto assets in particular, uh, the the reason that you founded the company and developed these services was really to solve a broader issue in asset management that doesn't really have anything to do with crypto investment per se. Am I understanding that right? Yeah, absolutely. It's not like core focused on just the crypto, but in general in the fund management. So any kind of multi-asset uh, portfolio, multi-manager -manage, uh, portfolio, all these things can be managed on through the platform. Got it. That's really helpful context. Um, and Jack, I mean, you tell me, but I feel like that resonates with a lot of the approach to building product uh, at SFOX, because I know, like you said, you came into SFOX from the background of actually running your own fund. I know you've tried to solve a lot of the issues that you encountered yourself uh, as a fund manager uh, as you've been building stuff for SFOX. Uh, and I know that a lot of SFOX's design philosophy has come out of you know trying to solve in the first place the problems that are actually encountered by traders and asset managers as opposed to things that are maybe more specific uh, or particular to crypto. Is that right? Maybe you can walk me through the process a little bit of how you think about that. Yeah, you know, I think uh, even at my previous fund, right, we we certainly faced a number of of operational issues, and and a large part of that is, you know, uh, crypto is kind of infinitely iterating all the time, constantly. Uh, you know, the liquidity sources are changing, uh, where people are trading changes, um, and so you kind of have to be very uh, nimble 
as a as an asset manager, uh, you know, where to deploy capital, how to report on all of these things. Um, and so, you know, our focus is is kind of solving that by allowing our clients to focus on their actual business objective, which generally is, you know, uh, generating a return for their investors um, with a unified platform that kind of brings all of this in in one place. Uh, we do the work of, you know, uh, uh, aggregating liquidity, right, and, and ensuring that there is a depth of book suitable for a scalable fund, a scalable deployment of capital, um, so that the that our client can focus on again their their strategy, what they specialize in, um, and I think that's that's really the partnership that both you know we look to uh, just uh, create with our clients, but also uh, you know aligns our incentives, right? Our we're we are successful when our clients are successful. So the better product that we can build by kind of you know unifying all of this into a single vertically integrated platform, uh, the better we'll both you know come out of it. Yeah, I love that philosophy, guys. Before we get too far into the weeds, I, I want to put a question to both of you, perhaps taking a step back because, as you know, we've had conversations with some you know very in the weeds and scaled asset managers before on the series, uh, but there might be some people in the audience who are just, you know, contemplating the idea of developing a fund for the first time. Um, Kumar, I love your example of getting into the asset class of crypto really just by stumbling upon Bitcoin because of someone you knew who was working on it back in the day. I feel like whether they'll describe themselves like this or not, a lot of investors in the crypto space or people who are holding Bitcoin sort of fell into it in that way. And so maybe even if they're interested in something like the development of a fund or scaling their operations, they don't really know which end is up in terms of where to start. And like I said at the beginning, oftentimes everything that comes in terms of fund administration and the different services to plug into, that can feel like a black box. So for people like that who are you know, just trying to figure out how to put together fund operations or to scale up after they have something that you know, seems to be working on a small scale, but doesn't really know how to grow, uh, what would you say is like a sort of minimum viable service package or you know group of support administrative mechanics that they need in order to really make their strategy sing and grow and scale sorry i was on mute uh, a very valid question a lot of people who have uh, exposure or uh, been working in the space for a while and it seems very lucrative and wants to start a fund but they just shy away because there's a lot of overhead of just setting up a fund so generally, there's like two ways uh, people think. Either they, you can put together your own money and then start like crypto trading. And that's what generally people start with. And then you go and become a more professional. Either you partner with a fund manager or you become your own fund manager and pull in money. But end of the day, if you want to do, start with the, regulate, the regulated fund structure. So you have to go through the some basic, basic uh, problems. So you have first setting up an entity. You have to have a fund formation. So you have to have a set of entity. There is a bunch of services you can use for that one, uh, which is, so you can typically start with a simple LSE or you can go through the full nine year and set up like a fund. And then you can decide which type of, uh, when you're formation, the fund formation, then you start like 506 C, B, all these regulations, what you want to do. So, but someone who's just starting can start a simple LLC structure too, and then, or LLP, depending on how they're starting it. So that's the step one. Once you've done that, then you have LP, so you have to have a LP management. So you have to go through the some LP agreement, pass those agreements, get the money. So that's where you need some services for the administration. So because you once you're taking someone else's money, you have to go through the process of like, LP agreement, then you have to do capital card management, you have to uh, do the distribution of the fund, all these things you have to do it after that. So once you're taking someone else's money. And to do all these things, the two things required, one is regulations and the second is a platform. So 90% people today, the way it's done is like, it's more like a non-tech format. So some accounting firm or legal firm will help you to do this and report it back and generate a quarterly report and give it to you. Or this, the way we we try to do it is we do it more like a tech format. So we provide all the LPs on a simple way to onboard. They go through the process, do the KYC, AML accreditation, all which is re required. Done the paperwork and write on the platform. You can sign these all these things done. So it's all baked into one simple user experience, like using a simple app. 
but these are the back end how you uh, back end stuff which you anyone has to do it when they have to start a fund by themselves so that's part of the lp now after that it, asset allocation so where you want to get to deploy the capital correct so ideal way to do it is work with some prime brokerage because you do not by yourself don't want to deal with like multiple of exchanges and just deploying the capital and manage where to deploy it so like s fox coinbase prime there's a bunch of uh, players where you can plug in so that's your second asset allocation and then on top of that your strategy so now when you're picking the asset allocate uh, prime brokerage account then you have a bunch of other things you have to think about which jack was talking about liquidity provider how fast you can uh, basically deploy these what type of strategy you can deploy it can you do it in a DeFi strategies can you do play, uh, uh, play uh, derivative products so which jurisdiction you can do it so all these things come into the picture which basically allow people to shy away from like setting up the fund so what we have tried to do is like how much we can automate these things for you in the back office so as a fund manager you come on a platform you invite your LPs you create a basically you create a, your fund performa and then invite LPs, they sign it the process and they're ready to go. And then you can plug in with the uh, with the prime brokerage account and it's ready to go basically. Jack, if you'd like to add on this part, <laughs> because that's one of the critical thing. Yeah, any asset allocation. No, Kumar, you, you certainly covered a lot there and, and kind of uh, yeah, teed me up nicely, I guess. So thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, when it comes to that, uh, prime broker type relationship, right? With the uh, you know kind of suite of of services to actually deploy the capital. Um, there's also, unfortunately, a lot of individual components uh, within that, right? And I kind of try to think about this in terms of the overall trade life cycle. Uh, so pre-trade, you know, starts with efficient and secure custody, like you know our SVOC safe solution. Uh, you might need prime services to be a little bit more capital efficient, and depending on your risk appetite, uh, and then come trade, right? You have liquidity, execution, uh, and then post-trade reporting, settlement, all loops back to custody, right? And, and fortunately though, you know, SFOX does all of that trade lifecycle management in a single unified platform. I think Kumar, one of the things, you know, that's really interesting too, and, and an issue that I faced in my previous fund was, you know, the amount of, of data, especially, you know, uh, for kind of higher frequency trading firms that's flowing through back to the back office and being able to report on that, you know, at the time, right, our fund admin, uh, you know, luckily they, they were able to connect to our exchange accounts and bring in the data, but this, the reporting itself was still monthly, right? So we, we would only see the report end of month. There's no, you know, uh, mid month, let's, you know, see how things are going from an accounting perspective. If we wanted to do that, we'd have to essentially replicate our fund admin solution ourselves. Uh, we were a small team, right? You know, we're we're focused on generating a return. Uh, so I think it's it's you know really interesting to see that there is a solution out there that can uh, you know kind of seamlessly integrate with the you know the type the prime broker type relationship and bring that data in essentially you know kind of in real time, but also in a very auditable. Uh, uh, you know, history uh, sort of view yeah. that allows, you know, a much more efficient operation. Absolutely. That, that's one of the core problem statement, which we started, like data is a big problem. And then based on the all mm -hmm. data, every report is your next product by product. So we focus like how fast in how much in real time we can deliver you that information that you have full insight about your allocations, where your capital is allocated, how it's distributed and everything. So that, you don't have a lagged report. So you know, oh, my nav is this, but I don't know exactly what it'll be today. <laughs> you know, that's one of the big problems. Uh, and now I want to put a pin in that data conversation because it does segue really nicely into the next thing I wanted to chat about. But uh, our dear audience has already broken the seal on the Q&A box uh, in a way that really nicely dovetails with what we were just talking about. And I didn't even have to bully you all. So cheers to you. So much the better. Uh, so I do want to I want to get this question in before we move on with, with the other questions. Um, it pertains to, uh, I would say, establishing one's track record before setting up something like a fund. So this attendee asks, where else can a trader manage individual accounts to build a track record and some income base before setting up a fund? 
That's, uh, I'll, I'll jump in there. That's a, a great question. Um, essentially, kind of how you know I started my previous fund as well, managing a smaller amount of capital, aiming to build up that that track record of performance that we could then go on to raise capital from outside investors. Um, and really, you know, uh, the best solution I found, and yes, I'm biased, but at SFOX, right, we do have a, a feature called you know separately managed accounts where a, a portfolio manager uh, advisor can manage kind of individual uh, portfolios on behalf of investors. Uh, but really, generally, I think it's it's important to to kind of start with uh, you know essentially one one platform that uh, kind of simplifies the 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 goal, right? The goal is to build up that track record, start deploying capital, start generating return. Um, you know, there's there's plenty of places to deploy capital in crypto. I think the you know the nice thing about uh, you know a partnership with a firm like SFOX is we we are kind of set up to you know see you all the way through to scalability when you're raising you know capital from outside investors, right? So you can come with up, come to us as an individual, as a business. Uh, the platform is open and create an account. Um, and yes, you know it's it's an institutional grade platform, but even as an individual, uh, you know, with a smaller amount of capital looking to build up that track record, you're still getting all of the value uh, from the SFOX platform. Um, and then as you scale, as the AUM grows, right, there's this myriad of other features that you know you can leverage on the same platform uh, to yeah to to kind of scale with your business, whether that's you know inviting new team members to your own account with uh, with permissions, uh, workflow automation to ensure that assets are secure, and you have a kind of a approval system for the management of assets uh, within the account. But yeah, I think those are really the key things to to look for. Uh, but yeah, uh, happy to 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 shed some light there, and uh, yeah, we're, our team would be happy to help build up that track record. I think just to uh, selfishly in an also biased way, just pick up on the last thing you said, Jack. I mean, we did call this webinar a uh, discussion of the pit crew uh, when it comes to um, crypto asset management. And I think, you know, uh, one big piece of the puzzle when it comes to something like establishing your track record is having the right tools with the right goal in mind. But I think the other big piece, especially when you are just setting out, is working with service providers who, you know, have a team that is willing to listen to you and support you and help you figure out how to avail yourself of those services in a way that is most conducive to your goal, uh, which is another thing that is great across SFOX and Dwellfy, to be sure. Um, I want to take a pin out of the, the data topic now, Kumar, and I'll, I'll give you just a little bit of, of background to share with you where I'm coming from on this question, because you, know, you talked about the, the intrinsic value of one's data when you're managing assets, especially traditionally illiquid assets, and the value of putting a lot of this fund management on a, a publicly accessible blockchain as a source of immutable truth. Um, I love that. It's something that I'm interested in your experience with and your design perspective on, especially to the extent that you serve asset managers who are playing in spaces other than crypto. Because uh, at, at my last company, actually, we were working on basically tokenizing single family residential, uh, which was, uh, as you might imagine, a, a very multidisciplinary and challenging project, but also one that led to me having a lot of conversations with dyed in the wool traditional real estate people who said, you you want to put it on what? What's a blockchain? Why why do I need these tokens? I know how to put money into real estate. So like, what sort of challenges have you faced in terms of like explaining and representing the value of this to people who are outside the crypto space, given that you are playing with these traditional assets? And like, how would you pitch the value of the, like you said, a tech based approach to fund administration, which definitely seems to me right now, still the exception rather than the rule in the sector you play in. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and this is like one of the big uh, problems. So we have uh, uh, close to 500 LPs uh, on the platform who are managing their assets and mostly non-traditional assets. And they've been always invested in non-traditional assets. So for them having a, a platform which gives them a, like exposure to a digital uh, Rome is completely uh, new. And they all like, first time when we uh, did this, uh, did a launch before that we did a webinar like this. And uh, there was a really <laughs> uh, overwhelming uh, support from people because everyone wanted to know exactly what, and they had like a bunch of questions. So ideally, the uh, the, if you think from a perspective uh, of a non-traditional uh, crypto native people who are coming to this space, the first thing they uh, they think that, okay, 
when I go to crypto, that means there is some kind of cryptocurrency involved in this one, and that becomes a token. And now that is like, I, I'm not touching fiat. And at the end of the day, non-traditional people, everyone wants to have fiat, correct? So that's that's one of the first problem they face. Like what's going to happen with my fiat? It's converted to token. And what is the value of the token? Is it just spoof or what? So, so idea is uh, basically what we do when we bring the traditional asset, we're not like moving away people from the fiat. All the transactions, you can do it in fiat or you can do it in stable, so you can do it in crypto, but it's up to you how you want to do it, but we're not away from fiat. The whole value proposition is uh, two things. When you look at any traditional asset, uh, and especially in private fund, the biggest problem in the, I would not say problem, but that's by the nature, is the private funds are mostly opaque. And that's by the nature because you are a private fund. You don't want to expose your strategies and data and all those things. But at the same time, it also causes a problem. The problem is about reporting liabilities and all those things, like how you can people can trust those things, correct? So because of that, the third problem arises, which is liquidity. So if you want to take these assets and then want to go as a public trading market you can always borrow against that asset but in private market you cannot borrow but the reason why because nobody knows exactly what is the underlying value of that asset that's what we try to solve it once we bring all these assets on chain now every single data related to that asset is verifiable and it's on on chain so anyone can access not anyone but based on the fund permission can access do the underwriting once you do the underwriting now you have access to that money, which is unlocked based on the underwriting value. So to take a very simple example, this works like as a, uh, this this literally works like a HELOC product. So you have invested a, a money in a fund. And now because that fund is on Delphi platform and has that uh, lender partnership, you will have access to line of credit against your investment. And the reason why it's there, because in the back end the lender has every single access to your underlying fund performance, uh, asset data, and the LP data so that they can do underwriting in real time and give you uh, access to your uh, to the liquidity. So that's that's what we do. And it takes time to, for people to understand. But once they understand this, they, under, they really uh, value this product because now, which was not possible previously, is now possible. Now this this is more like a HELOC product. You can just go and borrow against your assets. I do really like that analogy. You make your funds work more like a HELOC. Like that is that's very intuitive and something that I can wrap my head around. Um, Jack, I wanted to ask a little bit more about as Fox's design philosophy in terms of what problems it solves specifically within crypto and and what problems it solves in fund management more broadly. And I think Kumar's comment on the the extent to which people value and want to figure out how to engage with their existing fiat currency is perhaps a really useful way into it because you know i think um at least one of the like loudest sub themes of this year within crypto i would say is is people wondering as the industry continues to evolve like where are my off and on ramps like how can i get uh easily to crypto from fiat and vice versa uh which seems to become an increasingly valuable question given some of the stuff that has recently happened in the space so maybe you can talk a bit about how s fox has approached and and asset management uh with a particular emphasis on navigating the gap between fiat and crypto that's a, a great question um i think you know we play we're trying to play a kind of pivotal role in acting as that uh, you know, institutional bridge, uh, you know, for investors in traditional asset classes or, you know, just businesses that are new to the asset class that can easily kind of expand into the space. Um, you know, you mentioned a couple of key points there, right? On and off ramps, moving cash into the asset class, taking cash out of the asset class. Um, and that's, you know, these are kind of critical uh, uh, partnerships and, and roles that are really the foundation of you know, the entry point and, and SFOX as, as a platform overall, right? Uh, you know, kind of almost having to play well with, with others, uh, you know, from a traditional standpoint, even, yeah. even to the service provider angle, there's plenty of, you know, accounting firms, right, that might not necessarily be familiar with the asset class, and maybe one of their funds is, is branching out into it, um, you know, deploying some capital. And so when it comes to reporting, 
right? That has to be structured in a way that's easily kind of uh, uh, ingestible by a more traditional firm, right? And, and into an existing portfolio of assets. Uh, there are other things that honestly just kind of you know, work well in more traditional asset classes. And, and we look to, you know, uh, learn from those and, and improve on others that that might not. You know, I think one thing in particular is is uh, custody of assets, right? I think in you know, traditional asset classes, um, custody kind of just happens, right? You don't really think about it. Uh, within your brokerage account, your assets are held with a custodian, but you might not even know who that custodian is. Um, and in crypto, that's very different, right? It's I think that's a, a huge uh, topic of conversation in the space today. Uh, but when we were building our own custody solution uh, with SAFE, you know, we really wanted to emulate that experience because it does work well, right? Custody is not uh, something that you, know, you as an asset allocator or uh, investor should have to worry about or think you know, too much about other than knowing that your assets are secure. So you know, with SAFE, you know, you're getting the, the security of a regulated custodian with bankruptcy protection, uh, but also an experience that seamlessly integrates with the rest of the SBOX platform. So you, know, you have trading, staking more from custody, um, and you don't have to really think about it, right? It's, it's there, you're protected, your assets are secure, but it's seamless and you can focus on you know, uh, the overall goal of the business. I love that. That's really helpful color. Um, now, guys, maybe we can take a step back and think about kind of the the philosophy of the pit crew that we're talking about in terms of service providers, because I know all of us on this call in terms of business decision making have had to weigh a question that I'm sure probably some people in the audience have had to think about or are currently thinking about, should I build this functionality in-house or should I partner with a service provider uh, in order to gain the advantages of them and their expertise. And so if I'm someone who's you know, building a fund or trying to figure out how to grow my existing operations, what would you say are the trade-offs to weigh between building a lot of these back office competencies in-house versus using a service provider in the first place? So that's one. But then secondly, if and when I decide to go the service provider route, what are some of the guiding principles or best practices for feeling out and making sure like, yeah, this is a service provider that doesn't just have the right tech, but also is going to be the right fit for my particular business uh, or fund operations to make sure that I succeed and they'll be in it for the long haul with me as a partner? Yeah. Uh, so, so let me take on this one. I think the build versus buy is like one of the big problem questions. It doesn't matter you are in fund or enterprise software wherever that is like one of the key key problem people face is when they want to start this especially when you're looking in the fund management uh until unless you're not even like large to large companies everyone focus on buying the services versus build and the reason why is as a fund manager or a capital allocator you core focus should be how I can multiply my investment. And that's where you want to focus on deal making, deploying the capital, understanding the asset classes, not <laughs> taking care of your back office and, and other stuff. So so in, in this particular case, fund case is absolutely uh, buying the services and partnering the services is the best way to go. Second is that the more important question is now is like when you are picking the partner, how you pick the partner. So if you're picking the partner, there's, <coughs> sorry, the traditional way uh, would people have done it, like if you see, uh, mostly because there's a bunch of back office services you need. So you partner with accounting firm, you partner with a, like a, a CFA, then a tech uh, vendor, then a fund admin. There's a, a lot of these uh, services. And what it does is like, when you partner with a bunch of these services, Eventually, it creates the problem of your data because it's now your all data is unstructured. Eventually, it creates problem in reporting. Eventually, then it creates the problem in visibility. So you don't have the real visibility about your underlying assets and located allocation in real time. And then you have to eventually, you are responsible to report these things to the LP so you can give them the right picture. So the most important thing to pick the right partner is how many services is you are going to buy with them in a bundle. And then when you buy these services, you have to be very sure that all these services are 
very tightly integrated in the platform. It's not that this, this is a vendor which is giving you 10 mother services, but eventually they're doing the same thing which you're gonna do. So you can partner with 10 more people. So having that tightly integrated environment where you go to one place and then the rest back office is all integrated. So you don't have to bother about all these things and it's taking care of you. So that is important. And then, then eventually you decide about, okay, once you ha I have this one, how good of a customer service uh, this service provider can give me? Because at the end of the day, you have to rely on them like on so many uh, uh, basically uh, uh, parts. So to have that readily available for you to answer these questions is important. So customer service comes to the next. And once you have that one, then you can just like basically make, if you pick five or these or two of these or one of these, you can decide which where to go. But ideally I would say there's very few of them which can do all these things together, make your life easy. So it's, uh, then it'll be much easier to, for you to pick. Jack. Jack, how about from the SFOX perspective, uh, you know, why do funds decide to plug into SFOX's services as opposed to building some stuff on the back end themselves? And uh, why do they stick around once they do? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Kumar had honestly a, a lot of the, the key points, right? Uh, you know, as a as an asset allocator, your focus should be on, you know, multiplying those assets, um, you know, looking to uh, service providers uh, to partner with that you know, essentially take care of the other pieces for you that integrate well with one another um, and that kind of uh, you know, centralize uh, at least the, the core of you know, the data underlying you know, your asset allocation, portfolio, performance, et cetera. Um, and I think you know, for, for SFOX, it is uh, you know, really, I think you know, our, our specialty is you know, all the things in deploying capital in crypto. Um, you know, we, uh, we work to, to kind of integrate even with, uh, you know, partners like, uh, Dwellfy, you know, on, on reporting. So we're playing well kind of outside of, you know, the actual trade life cycle itself. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's our, it's our specialty to, you know, to focus on kind of crypto execution, liquidity, um, uh, and capital and, and our experience with other similar types of clients, right? I think, you know, even outside of SFOX and kind of the, the trading or, asset allocation piece, right? Your service providers should, you know, have experience with, you know, uh, other businesses that are similar to your own, other strategies, uh, so that you can kind of leverage their experience and their specialty in doing so. I think, you know, again, outside, you know, SFOX, that's that's kind of our unique specialty. Uh, but I think that's true, you know, as you're selecting any service provider for for your fund or or business that um, you know, that they do have experience in in that arena. Now, guys, I want to take a step back and drill into a little more of what you were saying, Kumar, in terms of integrations and getting various service providers to talk to each other. As I mentioned on the last couple of these webinars we've had for the series, we've had some really great fund managers on here, and, and they've talked over and over again, as you might imagine, about diversification as one aspect of risk management. Of course, they've been thinking about that in terms of portfolio management, but I think it's worthwhile to consider a similar perspective when it comes to service providers. Uh, I might imagine people feeling as if there may or may not be some risk to their business if they put all or most of their eggs in one basket, so to speak, in terms of looking to one partner uh, for the provision of many services that they depend on for their day-to-day -day business life cycles. Um, so do you have a perspective on you know, whether it makes sense to distribute across service providers in order to reduce that risk? Do you think that's an imaginary problem? And to the extent that we do hook up multiple service providers in our operations, uh, like, like you were saying, Jack, with the example of Dwellfi and SFOX, what are the best ways to ensure that they do in fact talk to each other like you were advocating for before? Okay, so my perspective is uh, it should be at one place. So it's so when you talk about the uh, two, two perspective, one is you're talking about the asset diversification for the risk management. Absolutely makes sense. There's no question to that. But the other part of that, that is completely contrary to that one. When you are diversifying your service provider, what you're doing is you are increasing your risk. Why? The reason why you're increasing your risk is when you buy these services, you're not buying one service 
to multiple players. Rather, you are buying one service to one player. So if one fails and then the rest is working, you still have that failure, which will eventually boils down to your event, uh, the ultimate reporting. So you're not, by diversifying, you're not de-risking anything. You're basically having the same risk that, okay, uh, this fails, then it fails. There is no uh, fallback. So having everything integrated in one place, your risk of losing that is lower because now you have one player which has multiple integration. If something fails, you have to have the one person to take care of that. And that person as an integrator with the several services had the sole responsibility to how to do with one or multiple of those backend services so that they can give you a streamlined service at a, any given point. So your consolidation of all your services at one place is less riskier than diversifying your uh, integration, uh, different integration of service provider. Yeah, uh, Kumar, I think, you know, from a back office perspective, uh, I definitely agree there. I think Dwellfi has a very kind of unique solution to mitigating, uh, you know, the service provider risk there in that uh, the data itself, the, the, the kind of key piece of information that's, you know, uh, that all of these other service providers use uh, is centralized and, you know, put on chain. So it's, it's immutable and, and the history is, is there, right? And I think that's, uh, that's spot on. And um, so you, you really have a, a unique solution to kind of mitigating uh, that risk itself. I think when it comes to, you know, asset deployment and allocation, um, you know, it is important to identify the key points of risk to begin with, right? I think, uh, you know, the two, uh, the two top probably in crypto and, and, you know, just asset classes generally, one would be custody, right? Where, where are my assets stored? How are they stored? How secure are they? Um, and, and, you know, depending on the custodians used and, and the solution that, that you come up with or the partner, some diversification can be good. Uh, some custodians kind of focus in uh, one where area or the other. I think, uh, you know, for a regulated, you know, uh, bankruptcy protected custody solution like SAFE, uh, that tends to kind of mitigate that that counterparty risk. The other area would just be you know trading counterparties, right? Uh, when you're actually deploying the capital um, and taking risk itself, uh, definitely uh, important to you know uh, both assess the counterparty itself, but also kind of assess how much risk you're willing to allocate to that singular counterparty. And and there generally diversification can can certainly be be positive, right? It it certainly makes things easier when it's a single counterparty, uh, but you know it's it's a that is very much a risk appetite decision, um, especially at scale when you're deploying you know a lot of capital. Uh, diversification can uh, definitely be the uh, a good way to go. Now we have 15 minutes left, and a few more questions here. I'll remind the audience uh, if there's anything you want to know about anything to do with the back office of fund administration. <laughs> These are the guys to ask, and this is the time to do it. Uh, and thankfully, we did get another question. So my reminder might not even be warranted. Uh, Kamar, this one is specifically put to you with regard to Dwellfi. Do your clients start with one service and then add services as their confidence increases? Or do most clients you find sign up for everything you offer at once? Yeah, the good question. So <clears throat> most of our clients are like large funds, uh, over $50 million. So they start with most of the services which you provide. But to answer your question, it, it depends on where you want to start, depending on the life cycle of your fund. Could be a very small fund or could be a large fund. When you start at that lower scale, then you don't need all the services. So what whatever bare minimum you, can, uh, you want, you can start with that. And as you grow with us and then have more, more funds, you add multiple funds, multiple assets, then you need multiple uh, different services and you can add those services as an add-on. Did that so answer can, your question? I think it, I, th I would say it does, <laughs> but it wasn't my question. Uh, Let's let's drill into that a little further, though, because that was another thing I was interested in. You know, we we wanted to provide a lot of information and color to people who are thinking about the back office of fund administration in crypto. But the fact of the matter is, as you just said, like over the course of a fund's life cycle, the fund can look different uh, and its needs can look very different as well. Um, so are there particular services that you would call out as important for people to think about uh, you know, in the beginning of their fund setup versus, you know, as, as the fund has matured and is further along, like what's the best way to wrap your head around changing service provider stacks as your fund evolves? So 
as an early stage fund, when you're uh, early stage, you could be like a single solo uh, fund manager and you don't have any GP. Let's say you are the only one and you could be managing your own money acting as a uh, as a business. So that could be the, the most nucleus, nuclear way of uh, thinking about like the smallest piece of the fund. And then as you start growing, now you can add more LPs in your fund. So as you start LPs, then you have to do more reporting. And you become you have to be compliance with a lot of different stuff. You have to do a lot of paperwork. First, just to onboard LPs, you have to go through a bunch of paperwork, have LP agreement, have a, uh, start the reporting, all these things you have to start doing that. So that's that's the the second step of that. As you start growing further, you could be you can diversify your assets and you start investing in crypto, you can start investing in real estate, you can like different type of assets classes. So at that stage, you are managing multiple type, multi assets. And then as you go further, you can have multi asset managers and each asset managers can manage their own assets. Plus as a, and then you as a fund entity, you have to have a bird eye view of everything what is happening. So at that time, your reporting and uh, back office structures also changes because now you're working multiple funds, multiple assets, multiple asset managers, and, and then multiple LPs. So that, that's how you can like grow from here to there. And each stage you need some services, but to, to a point when you start managing LPs, uh, your services become a standard that you have to have those services. Either you have one LPs or you have hundred LPs, but the things will change is depending on the different type of asset class. So as asset class changes, it's like if you are in crypto, then you have a different reporting uh, requirement, but when you are in uh, real world asset, real estate and all, the reporting will change accounting will change. So that's that's how uh, it, it will change depending on where you are in your fund life cycle. Totally. Um, now, Jack, you and I talk a lot about you know, the idea of SFOX as this full service asset management suite. Do you also feel like that's part of the value proposition it offers that it's equipped to help people at every stage of their journey to building and raising and deploying a fund or is it better suited to some of those stages than others? No, uh, yeah, actually, absolutely. Kind of, uh, you know, SFOX is is an open platform, right? Anyone can, uh, you know, uh, sign up, create an account, you know, big or small. There's no, you know, minimums or anything like that, um, and and you know, gain kind of full access to our uh, suite of uh, features, products, services, our team as well. Um, I think, you know, of course, we we focus on building the platform in a way. Uh, that is, you know, kind of uh, at, you know, for asset managers at scale, uh, but that, you know, that value still uh, you know, flows down to the single asset manager or single individual who is, you know, managing their own or, you know, a couple of individuals uh, portfolios. Um, so I think that that's kind of, I guess, one of the unique benefits of the way that we you know, focus uh, you know, building the, the products in the platform um, is that, you know, yes, again, we're, we're kind of focused on the, the professionals and, and institutions, but at the same time, you know, keeping it, it open and uh, universal um, so that the user experience is, is accessible uh, and meaningful to, you know, investors, big and small. Excellent. Now, in the last nine minutes or so, gentlemen, we've talked a lot about the nitty gritty nuts and bolts of back office administration and what service providers look like in that landscape and how, you know, up and coming fund uh, managers can think about those various issues. I want to take a step back and think about a lot more of the, um, you might call them the soft factors, things that aren't the tech per se, uh, but in some ways are even more important in terms of the community and the guiding design philosophies. So in the first place, uh, you know, one of the reasons that we're even doing a webinar like this is because a big part of SFOX's approach is not just offering a tech stack to help people trade, but also a community to give them access to a lot of the resources and knowledge base uh, that might be hard to find uh, in, a, in a single aggregated and trustworthy way otherwise. Uh, so I was hoping, you know, moving back and looking beyond just the tech stack, could you guys speak a bit to just the the value of things like client relations uh, and the support that you think a service provider ought to offer and that you do offer at Dwellfi and SFOX uh, beyond just access to things like an API and self-service and things like that? Yeah, I think, uh, Kumar, you, you mentioned a, a key point earlier, right, which is, uh, you know, as, a, as an investor, you know, your specialty should be uh, generating returns for your investors. 
Um, and at SFOX, right, we aim to kind of specialize in the components that make that possible from an asset deployment and management perspective. Um, and with that, you know, our experience is also with other clients, uh, other businesses, um, you know, really of all shapes and sizes. Sizes. So we're very familiar with their operations, um, you know, what they've done to succeed, how we've helped them succeed, uh, you know, uh, other areas where uh, we've had to kind of improve things, but also even kind of the service providers that they use and and how well those kind of all integrate together. Um, and so, yeah, we we certainly aim to, you know, we want our clients to feel comfortable kind of leaning on us to, you know, provide those insights and answers because again, uh, we succeed if, if our clients succeed. Uh, so, you know, we want uh, that to feel like we can provide our own experience, uh, you know, from the soft service uh, kind of point of view uh, to help, to help our clients succeed. Yeah, actually, you're absolutely right. This is one of the key uh, important feature for any service provider should have have a com compassion about your clients because they're using your services and they're relying on you. And as a moral fiduciary duty or moral duty, it makes sense for you to provide the, the ex to meet their expectation. So we focus on those area very strongly. So whenever we onboard our client, we treat them like as one of us. So, uh, and then we also have to think about that these clients are coming to us and they are completely coming from a non-traditional crypto place and coming into this whole new world of crypto where there's a lot of questions they have before even getting onboarded. So we try to educate people more and more about this. Then once they get the education, they basically we onboard, we try to do webinar. And then at the end of the day, there are, we try to be as much transparent as possible so that they don't feel that, okay, uh, it's kind of a black box service, which generally people feel about like uh, when you are doing uh, some of the asset management and all. So for the even for the LPs and the GPs, we try to bring transparency. So there is there is no conflict between either LPs, GPs, or the service providers and LPs and GPs. So that's our core uh, principle. One of the core principle is to bring more transparency, more auditability, and people should not be feel like they're in, in kind of dark. I love also that word you said, compassion, Kumar. I feel like so many people leave that out of the equation when it comes to stuff like asset management, but especially when it comes to the service providers you choose, it can make all the difference. Uh, it calls to mind what you said earlier, Jack, about how SFOX wins when its clients wins, uh, when yeah. they win, excuse me. So it's uh, it's all about value alignment, right? And incentive alignment. And it sounds like it's exactly the same way for Dwellfi, Kumar. Um, guys, last question for you, uh, and I try to ask this of everyone whom we bring on here. You know, I think it's it's all well and good to engage in asset management and service provider development in the crypto sector and the blockchain sector. Um, but I really love when builders and the people working in in this area, in one way or another, also have an ethos in terms of how they want their product or services or even the spirit of their company to contribute to the further development of this ecosystem and asset class, especially since it's still so new and rapidly growing and finding its place in the world. So I'd love to give you both the chance just to speak for a moment to uh, what value you want to create in crypto and blockchain through your services and through your company. Yeah, so how we uh, take this as like to create more uh, value in the entire crypto ecosystem is how we can bring more and more people who are non-crypto and they have not crypto the exposure, but get somehow in this world without being burned, but get an exposure and start using it. So, and we have seen this uh, through our platform pretty much working really well because when we onboarded first time our customers, there were like over 500 LPs who have never had any exposure to crypto. But then when we they started using the platform and then slowly they realized, okay, what is the value of the crypto? How it can, how they can interact? What is a wallet? All these things, because it can become overwhelming a lot when you start using it. And even just word jargon, it just becomes super overwhelming. So how smoothly you can bring people to this world, uh, crypto side, and then they get exposure and then slowly learn that and then start interacting with the platform 
it doesn't matter just DualFi, but any platform, crypto platform. So, so it becomes like a widely acceptable and uh, adoptable uh, ecosystem. So that's that's what we want to contribute to bring more and more non-crypto people to this space. Great. Uh, and yeah, I, I'm going to sound a bit like a broken record. I've mentioned the, these <laughs> points a few times uh, throughout the webinar. But uh, yeah, anyway, uh, I think, you know, first and foremost, right, is uh, enabling our clients to uh, maximize returns in digital assets across, you know, trading, custody, finance, um, aligning our incentives again, you know, with our clients uh, so that we succeed when they succeed. And then, you know, similar to, to DwellFi as well. Uh, provide that bridge for new or existing businesses that are entering the space for the first time to very confidently uh, access and and uh, you know enable kind of the the opportunity that is the digital asset ecosystem. If there were ever a song for a broken record to play over and over again, that's a <laughs> damn good one in my opinion. I love it, um, Kumar. Jack, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. I know I've learned a lot just from chatting with both of you. Um, I know our attendees did too. I hope you all did enjoy this webinar. We're going to have many more coming your way. So keep your eyes peeled in your inbox. Uh, also keep your eyes peeled because we will be uh, delivering the recording of this, which will be available anytime on our YouTube channel. If you'd like to review it or share it with anyone who wasn't able to make it in person and keep your eyes peeled because while I'm not at liberty to discuss the details yet, I am very excited because it sounds like in the near future, SFOX users are going to get uh, access to a pretty special and very cool offer to benefit from uh, just the kind of DwellFi integration that we were considering earlier in this very webinar. So uh, if you're here, if you're interested in solving some of the problems that SFOX and DwellFi uh, are so equipped to help you solve, uh, keep an eye out for that because there could be some good things coming your way. Uh, but for now, gents, thank you again. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you to everyone in our audience, and I'm looking forward to doing some more great stuff with you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.